the current value chain in financial services is under pressure. If you look, this is actually the, the simplified version of the current uh, value chain, where you see the customer being a consumer or a company, and you see the distribution part of the value chain, the manufacturing part of the value chain, and the market infrastructure. And when somebody has uh, money uh, spent, uh, um, uh, he can do uh, all sorts of personal savings uh, via the banks, or a customer, an individual, they could invest with a wealth uh, management uh, party. And then this money goes through the market uh, infrastructure to, for example, the wholesale banks for capital raising or lending to individuals or companies, which could be SME, of course, as well. What's actually also in the middle is the payments, which is, of course, very <coughs> important within the value chain. But this is how it could look like in the near future. What you really see is all sorts of fintech startups, and maybe not in wholesale banking, but at least in retail banking, in commercial banking, are entering the value chain. So they are starting in this part of the value chain, mainly the distribution office. And you could end up as banks in general, so not wholesale banker, but banks in general, end up somewhere in the manufacturing part. And mind you, there are also startups in that part of the value chain as well. And if you look at the um, a corporate side, the commercial banking side, you see lots of startups as well, maybe more on the lower side of the value chain, lower part of the market, but still lots of parties there, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer funding, etc. And also in the market infrastructure, lots of new entrants. And mind you, if this value chain isn't growing, then you have to divide all the earnings with all those people in this value chain. And these startups are often very good in data, in big data. And they are also very good in customer experience. So you probably should learn also from the customer experience from all sorts of fintech companies because they are setting the standard for the near future. So um, I would advise at least to learn from those, uh, those companies. Well, go to, to big data because that's what I'm going to talk about. Predictive services actually was the title of the presentation. Uh, do you know what this is? This is telling the story about big data because it took a long time to really know uh, what's happening in our DNA. So it uh, is lots of information and it's lots of unstructured information as well. Well, big data actually is, a, is some sort of a buzzword maybe to you. So let's explain what it actually is. And we often talk about the four Vs, which is about volume. The volumes are higher than a given organization actually could process. It's about variety. Uh, the analysis of any type of data, structured or unstructured, can lead to, uh, to new insights. It's also about the velocity. Data is generated very, very fast. And it's about veracity, the uncertainty of data. Take, for example, if you would like, for a consumer, for example, want to know the income of a consumer. Then you, of course, could look at the salary statement, salary slip. But you could also look at the statement and take all the amounts which are credited and which could be income. So you have more ways to, to come to the same intelligence. Um, and it all uses the different uh, data. And mind you, 94% of all current big data is created in the last years. Gartner already said that, yeah, it must be a hype. So uh, you are probably familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. And uh, big data is over there at the trough of this illusionment, which actually says that, well, it was a hype first. And then we thought, well, is this all? Is big data helping us out? And you can see. The prediction in, 90, or in, sorry, in 2014 was that uh, within five to ten years, uh, big data will, will reach the plateau of productivity. But um, actually, this year there's a new hype cycle, and big data is no longer a hype. It's gone. So actually, it is serious business right now, um, if we have to believe uh, Gartner. And we often say that, that the new technology gold rush actually is data. So it all starts with data mining. And then from the information, you go from data, because data in itself is, is, is worthless, actually. So you go from data to information and from information to intelligence. And the real value is in the intelligence. So what you really do with this data to make information of it and to make intelligence of it. But we have a problem. If we look at all the data stored in databases, then we see nowadays that, that lots of the data is unstructured and actually is created by consumers. So not wholesale banking consumers. And we're talking about Facebook updates, YouTube uploads. That's the lots of data, pictures on Flickr or whatever on Facebook, Twitter updates, uh, lots of unstructured data. And the structured data is just a small part. And it's very, very difficult to, to really do something with uh, unstructured data. 
And today I want to take a deep dive with you in two big data opportunities related to your business and wholesale banking, which is real-time credit risk management and what we could call the cross-channel relevancy engine. To begin with this one, real-time credit risk management. This was actually what happened. You <coughs> reviewed a credit a few times a year, you <coughs> checked the covenants, you talked to your customer, and you created this review, credit review. And you were always looking back. And of course, you were talking with your customer about the future, what the expectations are, but actually it's often the forecast projects the past in the future. That's what often happens. And there is uh, this person, that's uh, Nassim Nicholas Talent. he said, don't be a turkey. And maybe you know this guy, he wrote the book about black swan. And black swans are, uh, what he described, are the unexpected events. Well, so don't be the turkey, thinking that it's having a happy life and ending up with this unexpected event somewhere at Thanksgiving and ending up on your plate. The interesting about this is, is uh, what, uh, for example, uh, ABN AMRO did in the past. They created on data this sort of customer network. So you could see this as a customer network. For example, you have Volkswagen, but they have all those suppliers, which could be a customer of yours. And uh, all those suppliers have suppliers, suppliers, and you get this sort of network. You could say sort, sort of social uh, network of companies. And they are might be infected by what's happening at, at uh, Volkswagen. So uh, you couldn't predict what was happening, eh? maybe a few who were aware of what was happening at Volkswagen, but you as a person, we couldn't predict this was going to happen in um, uh, the last month with uh, Volkswagen. So what it's really about is not about data from the past, it's about real-time data. You have to use the data which is now. What is happening now? Can I use this for credit risk management? And there are lots of platforms in the US and uh, I agree they are mostly focused on, on consumers or on um, SME lending. But what you see is that they are really focusing on lots of data points. This, for example, is Zest Finance. It's a US-based company. Well, you know probably the FICO score, credit score. That's some sort of score everybody has in the US. But it's only about 15 to 20 variables they use for determining this score. Whilst uh, Zencast, for example, Z Zest Cash, I have to say, uses thousands of indicators to, to um, calculate the credit risk of a company. And this is what the, the CEO of Zest uh, Finance, and Zest Cash belongs to Zest Finance, says, and he's a former Google CIO, all data is credit data. So you actually should at look at all data but we just don't know how to use it yet. So all data might be interesting to, to determine what the credit score is. And if you look at this one, this is OnDeck. It's a uh, company also in the US. It's, well, it's providing small business loans. And uh, well, they have already granted their first billion to, to small business owners. And they are using more data than just your own credit score data. They are using of course, the proprietary banking data, but also public records. So they tap in, in in external databases. They use social data, transactional data related to um, payments. They use credit data, et cetera, et cetera. So the number of, of data they use is, is bigger. And they use mainly also external uh, sources for data. This is also familiar probably for the American people to your party. And uh, there's this computer that's called uh, IBM Watson. And he took part in the show as well, and he won. It's some sort of cognitive approach, uh, use of data, analytics, and he won uh, this show. So uh, regarding artificial intelligence, it's possible to, to outperform, well, those smart guys, at least in this TV program. So Watson, the interesting about Watson is that it has the cognitive capacity to really analyze all the unstructured data and to make an immediate rational assessment of risk. So it could help you. It's advanced analytics, it's machine learning, and sometimes it's maybe deep learning. It can help you really create better risk assessments. Okay, let's go to the second part. I promised you something about the cross-channel relevancy engine. Let's explain what it is. The cross-channel relevancy channel is about collecting all the data and information which could be relevant for from a customer. Then the interpretation, so it's about intelligence. The third part is about getting some sort of trigger to your customer, create the right message via the right channel. 
And the third part is then you create this call to action. You, you create this trigger for your customer, but you want him to do something with this information. <coughs> and of course, the reaction, what the customer does with this trigger is that it's, again, input for the observations. And when I'm talking about observations, it's about observations in the customer journey of your customer. And not only in the journey, which is part of your internal processes, but also outside that journey, so outside your organization. And it's about observations in your process. So you really should have this great workflow management system so you know where you are in the process, but also the, your customer knows where he is in the process, for example, a loan approval or whatever. And the observations in transactions, but also in the context. And the context has to be uh, with the emotion of your client or where is your client, so uh, just location, that sort of thing. To give you just an example, suppose you have this observation, you have an API with the accounting or ERP software of your customer, and in real time it can access the, the financials of your customer, including the rolling forecast of company X. Then you can have, could have the interpretation that the financials indicate that the agreed overdraft facility is exceeded, uh, related uh, and based on a borrowing base related to account receivables or debtors and current ratios, company X might be eligible for an extra facility. Well, now you could send a message to the CFO of the company. He receives an alert, for example, on his mobile phone with a binding offer for this extra facility. And the reaction could be that the CFO has the possibility to, to react to this offer or he could contact his relationship banker or loan products officer or whatsoever. Well, to picture this, Suppose the CFO is at the airport, uh, of course this is Schip Hall, and he gets this alert which says your financials indicate that the agreed overdraft facility will be exceeded. So he opens the app and what you actually see is your rolling forecast indicates that your overdraft facility will be exceeded within four weeks. Based on your outstanding accounts receivable, we can offer you an extra overdraft facility, get the offer or call your banker. In this way you can be really proactive to your customer and, and by using data, and by interpreting the data, and by creating relevant content for your customer. And if you look to trigger the right message and the right channel, that's also very important, because suppose you have this uh, loan approval of this customer. It's, he, he wants to know whether he gets this loan or not. Then he probably wants to know uh, this soon. And you think, well, maybe we should send a push message. But of course, a push message it's very intrusive, but it's also when we would sit at the table and we would have the t telephone in the middle and it would say, sorry, Mr. Speller, the loan approval didn't come through, then you could read it as well. So you have to think about what channel and what message, and you could think about the richness of a message, confidentiality, ur urgence, relevancy, intrusive, etc., etc. And then you can match this actually in some sort of business rule. This type of message is going to this channel, this type of message is going to that channel. While talking about um, all this, this big data, there's this privacy uh, thing. Especially for the Dutch people, they probably recognize this person, Hans Hagenaars from ING. There were some problems with privacy because there was an, a, a news clipping which said that ING was going to sell uh, customer data, which wasn't actually true, but there was this editor who needed a nice uh, heading for an article and he chose the heading of ING is selling this data. And this really was a problem because this was really the toe in the water principle for how are customers reacting on the fact that we are using data. And it was not good news for ING, I could, uh, can tell you that. So it's about privacy. And what I often say is that you have to treat privacy as a currency. So it should be an honest trade-off that I'm giving you something of my privacy or the privacy of my company and I want some value in return. <coughs> And that should be uh, the right trade-off between us. But the trade-off I have with you could be different than with, with you. Because we have another perception of privacy. Privacy is often in the eye of the beholder. This, this was a research done by Edelman Research, and they this was uh, with consumers. But they asked, for example, would you give away some of your privacy to, for example, a bank or a retail company or whatever? And this was the reaction they gave for financial services. 69% thought, well, this bank is asking this for their own <laughs> financial gain and not for my benefits. So what's really important if you're using the data of your customer is that you have to communicate what you are doing with this data, what value can he get in return. So there's this really good trade-off between value and uh, data.
To finish this presentation, these are the prerequisites for creating predictive services in, in commercial banking, wholesale banking. In your customer journey, it's about having this 360 customer view of the customer. Workflow management, I was mentioning that already. If, if you have all those processes for getting a loan or setting up this uh, cash pool or whatever, that it's, it's a process. So you should have this workflow management process where you can see where your customer is in the process. And if you know where the customer is in the process, please give this information to himself. Give alerts on the phone or whatever on the uh, 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 banking platform where he is in the process. It's about social listening. It's about using especially external data sources as well. And of course, when you have all this data, you, well, you should have this data warehouse. You should have this one place, single place, where all this data comes together. And preferably, it should be real-time data because lots of banks still have data which is, let's say, a week old, a month old. And you can't act or you can't create this, this uh, cross-channel relevancy engine using all data. It's not going to work. You really need real-time data. And if you have all this real-time uh, uh, data, then you are uh, capable of doing big data analytics, predictive modeling, and in the end, create all sorts of digital marketing campaigns, uh, sales, service, whatever. Uh, and then from an inbound perspective, because um, you see what the behavior of your customer is and you act upon the behavior of your customers.